Thank you, Simon. <laughs> Look, expert's a very inappropriate word, and you're going to see in my presentation. There's too many experts today. Everybody's an expert from government, union, management, the guy in the street. And I think that's a problem. Mining has never done worse, and we got more experts than we've ever had. And 20, 30, 40 years ago, you couldn't find a guy who even called himself an expert, but it didn't matter. Everybody made money in mining. So that's how everything we know from 20, 30, 40 years ago, it's gone upside down. It's 180 degrees. And I don't see it changing back, unfortunately. And we'll see some slides and pictures why. And I don't know if anybody's going to make money after seeing this, but I'm hoping I can save some people money because anybody who's been in mining has lost a lot of money and it's going to be hard to recover it for quite a few years from what I can see. But we'll take some questions here. There's always a lot of people sharper than me. I'm just an old guy who's seen a lot and remembers a little bit. Okay, return to the mean. I am an engineer. And if you do engineering, you realize, as Einstein said, God doesn't roll dice. He laid out lots of physical rules for the universe. And the nice thing about engineering, they always follow those rules, unlike the market, politicians, and even unlike economics that doesn't seem to follow rules. But physics, engineering, the rules are always the same. First rule is you can get sued, especially in the States, for saying things that are wrong. This document says it's going to be really hard for you to sue Katie's. You can sue me, but it'll be hard to sue Katie's. They call me a consultant, so they can cut me loose. Okay, rule number one in life and investing is know where you are on the curve. That's your starting point. If you don't know where you are on the curve, it's pretty hard to determine where you're going to go and how you're going to get there. So we're in South Africa. Where are we on the curve? There's 200 countries in the world. We're 25th largest country, and we're 25 in population. Not too bad. We're in the upper quartile. We're number 87 in GDP per person. We're down in the middle, and the middle is not very pretty. So large population, very large area to some of our competitors, especially when you look at Korea. Huh? We're 12 times bigger in Korea, same population, but we're sure not making the same money as Korea, are we? We're making half the money the Greeks are making. Now, do the Greeks really work twice as hard as us? I can't believe it. Do the Russians work twice as hard as us? The Argentinians, you know, to me, something's wrong. They're making twice as much as us. And I've been to those places. None of them are as rich as South African minerals. And I don't think the people work twice as hard as us. In China? I think the Chinese do work as hard as us, and it's funny they're only making the same. That's why companies are manufactured in China. Good value for money. OK, more. Where are we on the curve? Whether you watch Citibank, if you get their research, I've got my own research. I show us pushing close to $3 trillion. The fact is, South Africa's got more minerals than Russia and America combined. But I hate flashing this statistic around because the politicians and the unions, they love this statistic. They think just because we got the riches, you can ask for any kind of wages. You can spend any amount on your budget. You can borrow any amount because they say we're so rich. But we all know minerals don't just come out of the ground on their own. So yes, mineral wise, we are very unique. We have the minerals. And that's why this was the greatest mining country for arguably 100 years. It's not anymore. And it's not just gold and platinum, manganese, chrome. We do have just about half the world's known minerals. Problem is, we don't, I shouldn't say we've got nobody to mine them. We got a lot of people to mine them, but they're not allowed to. So, therefore, we got 6,152 abandoned mines. And we've had the greatest commodity boom the world's seen ever in a million years, a thousand years. This was the greatest commodity boom we saw. It's all over now. And all we got to show for it is 6,000 mines, and none of them reopened during the greatest commodity boom the world ever saw. Something's seriously wrong. OK, what kind of minerals are we producing? If I look at last year's production, coal was king. We got $11 billion for our coal, $8 billion for platinum, gold, six. 
Now, a few years back, you'll see, we used to mine 650 tons of gold every year. For decades, we mined 600 tons of gold every year. So that's four times bigger. We should have been making $24 billion last year just off gold. And it comes down. So $39 billion sounds good. But where's $39 billion on the curve? You'll see in a bit. OK, we make oil from coal. That's $6 billion. It saves us, and it creates jobs. That's good. Steel, $5, million, $5 billion. Feral chrome, feral manganese. So we generate $56 billion. We're actually mining $39 billion. So remember that 39, because you'll see Australia does three times that with half the population. Three times that number. OK, we're a resource pygmy by what we churn out. World oil, 2.2 trillion. Natural gas, 1.1. Mining and steel, 2 trillion. Four, five. So we churn out 1%. We should churn out more than that, huh? 1%. So we are a pygmy. OK, precious metals are 9% of this square, this circle. I'm trying to square the circle. Precious metals are 9%. Let's break that down. There's our precious metals. There's PGMs. The world produces more silver than it produces PGMs. And this gold, we produce 5% of the world's gold now. So we're almost smaller than a pygmy now. We're a picanine. We're a, a what is it, a toy palm. OK, investing in resources. This is going to be Forrest Gump asset management, if you're listening to me. You've probably heard Coronation and Alan Gray. Now you're listening to Forrest Gump. First, you've got to have a benchmark. If you're investing, what are you trying to do? You're trying to make more money than you have, right? So you've got these alternatives. Now, you need a benchmark if you're running a race. If you're running around the block, you, you need a, a benchmark to see, am I doing good? Am I doing bad? I'm at the top or the bottom. Everybody needs a benchmark in life. You go to a supermarket. You benchmark pick and pay with spar, et cetera. So what's your benchmark? You've got money, and boy, have you got options now. Like never before in the history of man, you've got more options. Even sitting in South Africa, you can buy anything, anywhere, never leave your seat. So it's too many options. So you've got to have a good benchmark. You're investing money. What are you trying to beat? What asset class? Equities. You know, there's only five. Which one do you want to be in? OK, now remember this. I'll repeat it as the day goes on. Earnings drive prices. You see a share go up, it's expected earnings or it's actual earnings. Earnings are the, the foundation, the rebar that you put a building on. If you don't have earnings, you better have a solid NAV. And it's not so often that NAV drives the share, it's earnings. And if you're in mining, metal prices drive earnings, right? OK, the currency can affect metal prices. The NEV can help hold a share up, but can't really push it up. Not very often, sometimes. And sentiment, yeah, sentiment can push a share up or down. People want to ban short selling. But I say, let the guys go. Sentiment is temporary. You need earnings to hold something up or push it down. OK, most investors, the benchmark is the S&P 500. And whether you go back 100 years, 50 years, 150 years, it's averaged about 11% total rate of return. You can get that right here. So before you take money out of S&P 500 and put it in a mining share, you're going to say, does this mining share give me a better IRR? Because if it doesn't, why do it? You know, Don't leave the Peloton. Anybody watch the Tour de France? You know about the Peloton, huh? Don't leave the Peloton unless you think you can beat it. You know, otherwise, go for the free ride. Almost nobody beats a Peloton over time. It catches everybody. All right, let's, this is my benchmark. This is most my clients' benchmark. Before I get their money, they say, how are you going to beat this, Pete? Because I can go on holiday, I can drink beer, I can dump work, and I'm going to make, on average, 11% over time in dollars. OK, earnings drive share prices, remember. So the S&P isn't going up on hot air. Its earnings go up. 
It's well supported by dollar earnings. Okay, our benchmark for years, we couldn't get out of here. So we had to invest in the ALSI, but the market's pretty efficient. The ALSI the also, also averaged 11% a year, but it was a little more volatile. So if you got a choice, you get a volatile index or a, a unvolatile index, both for 11, you know which one you're gonna take, right? The least volatility. So we gotta think. How long are investors going to keep coming here for the same return with more volatility? They're going to come here less and less. Okay, the mining index, over 55 years. Funny enough, huh? Everything reverts to the mean. Everybody gets sucked up by the peloton. Mining gave you 11 too. But look at the volatility in the mining index. Scary. How much longer are people going to be putting money in this index when they go in the all Z, the S&P, for a lot less volatility? This thing's on borrowed time. The gold index. For 100 years, you got over 13%, 13 to 14% by going in the gold index. That's why guys went into it. Yes, it had volatility, but not so much funny enough. We had excellent management, excellent ore bodies, excellent workers. Pension funds the world over would invest in our gold index because they got a 3% higher rate of return, 3% real in dollars. Okay, but notice where this graph ends, huh? It ends in 89, and that is literally when our gold index ended. I'll show you what happens after. But for 100 years, this was the case. This is why people bought it. Good returns, dependable returns. OK, we go back to the mining index. See, we beat it by 3%. OK, here's our resource index. Again, it's earnings. The resource index is falling because its earnings are falling. Huh? Forrest Gump logic. It's not science. Well, maybe a little bit of science, but it's basic science. Huh? Earnings fall, the index falls. And here's what's worrying. Look at last time we had a bull run. You know, This is a 100-year commodity boom. I've lived through two of them. I'm very fortunate. This is the big run we had in the last millennium, and this millennium started out. So it's unlikely anybody here is going to see another boom like this once in 100 years. And look how long this one fell. Earnings fell for 20 years. Now, Mark Twain said, history doesn't always repeat itself, but it rhymes. And I agree. It could easily rhyme. This could easily fall down another five or 10 years. Long, miserable. So when you hear these mining executives and mining investment banks talking about we're getting ready for the next bull run, then they're obviously going into a cryogenic frozen center because that's the only way you can prepare for the next bull run. You know, freeze yourself for 70, 80 years, in my view. So this is what worries me, and especially when you see what's coming next. Our earnings are already here, but our commodity prices, to, in my view, are still pretty high. And if these commodity prices revert to the mean, these earnings are coming down more. <coughs> okay, our best index. You saw the OZ has three components, industrials, financials, resources. The financials have done pretty good, but nothing like the industrials. So you compare the resources versus industrials. Now, I do believe in reversion to the mean, but that assumes everything remains the same. And you're going to see in f f some more slides, things have not remained the same on the resource sector. This 100, 120 year history we have, you're gonna see it's dramatically altered. And so it's always important to realize when something changes. So had nothing else changed, I would have been buying like crazy here. Because I know reversion to the mean works almost all the time. But look at, a lot of people started buying here and we've had another drop. Now this looks like a real buying opportunity. I only give it a 50-50 chance of being a buying opportunity. It might be worth picking up a couple if you're not already holding. See, earnings drive share prices. Never forget that. You take the earnings of the Indy over the Resi. You know, the Resi, it's, it's blown out way above its mean. It used to be a one-to-one -one ratio. For 100 years, it was a one-to-one -one ratio. 
Now it's down to 0.4. It's got at least a 50-50 chance of coming to a 0.3. So until these earnings, the market looks forward about 12 or 18 months, depending how bullish it is. So if the market sees earnings are going to improve 12 months from now, they will buy today. But if they were selling shares, they were selling mining shares today. That means the market can't see earnings turning up in 12 to 18 months. They could, they buy. They were selling today because when they look down the road 12 to 18 months, they still see things going down. Unbelievable performance by the Indy. Unbelievable. From 100 to 1,000, tenfold in about 10 years. Unprecedented. But there's a reason why. For everything, there's a reason why. And you'll see as we go. The Indy does not play in the same universe that the Resi does. It plays in a very different universe. And there, the Indy, yeah, earnings went nowhere for what, 20 years. But they're flying now. And one of the reasons that the industrial index earnings, anybody want to tell me why these earnings are flying now and they weren't flying then? Globalization. The earnings, they're South Africa's boat people. They didn't like where they were, so they got in the boat and they left. They immigrated. Look at our big industrial companies, NASPERS, breweries. They might have an office down there, but that's not where the earnings are coming from. SA's boat people. That's why they're beating the resi. They got out of town. They got out of the country. Will rising interest rates help our resources or hurt them? I think there's more reason to believe Rising rates will hurt them. But these rates aren't going up in a while. I'm pretty sure the world's got the Japanese disease. I believe that five years ago, I still believe it, which means they can keep printing money. Interest rates can stay low. Inflation's going to stay low. Japan's done it 25 years. I think the rest of the world can do it for another four or five. I don't think that's going to make resources go up, but it's going to buy them some time. Because, boy, if this was the old days and these things went up, you'd watch these resource shares come down another 50%. Okay, where are we on the curve? When you buy a resource index, what are you getting? Now look at, this is the Aussie. You buy the Aussie today, you're only getting 20% resi. You're getting some billetin, that's 10% of the Aussie. 4% Anglo, Sassel, but the resi now, Billiton's 56% of our resi. It's not even in the country. A couple coal mines. Anglos, it's more than half out of the country. So these shares, Sassel, half out of the country. Okay, you don't just do well because you leave the country. I must say, most of the mining countries I know, Australia, Canada, the States, they've got a bit of the South African disease. This, this boom. It's like a kid who inherited a bunch of money. He's worked hard all his life until he's about 30. Now he inherits millions and millions. For 12 years, he's just spending the money. Now all the money's gone. After 12 years of drinking, eating, womanizing, gambling, it's pretty hard to just come right. He eventually will, but that's happened to all the resource shares. What I'm getting at here, if you buy the resi today, they've taken Sassel out. So a quarter of the resi is Anglos, more than half is Billiton, 10% is Anglo Gold, 5% Platinum, 5% Other. It's not very diversified, but it's what you've got. So just realize that. If you're buying the resi, you're really banking on Billiton and Anglos, then you've got to bore down, okay, what makes Billiton go? It's got six commodities. What makes Anglos go? It's got five and a half, six commodities. So that's what's going to turn it around. We can look at that. Okay, rule three, I think this is rule three or four, huh? Earnings drive share prices, commodity prices drive earnings. Now, how can your earnings go up when the commodity's falling down? Okay, oil bounced from 46, it's up to 62. Thank heavens it bounced. It stabilized Sassel. Question is, this is a magnetic force. This is gravity, the mean. It's always pulling things towards the mean. Now. When we send somebody in space, they're, they're breaking free of the mean. And we can do it, 
But it's always difficult. It's always risky. It takes a lot of power to break away from the mean. So to me, it's going to be hard for us to stay at 60 when the world is pumping oil like crazy. They got shale gas, natural gas, solar power, coal coming out of your ears. I think it's going to be hard for oil to grow more than 60. And people are in debt, and they're pretty tapped out. So I think there's at least a 50-50 chance oil's going to be weak. Might not come below 50, but I think it's going to stay down here for the next few years. Iron ore. Don't ask me what was going on here. I don't know. You know, I think it was all the planets lining up together. It was China that slowly had come from being nothing to being the second richest, most powerful country on the planet. And it was continuing to grow at 12, 13, 14%. So you got China doing that. You got a global financial crisis. So they're pumping out all the money you can imagine at zero interest rates. You've got um, consumers going mad. I, you know, low interest rates, Chinese voracious growth. They, they were taking more iron ore on their own than the whole world did a year before. But all that lined up. Easy credit, gambling. This was unsustainable. It was unwarranted. I think iron is the fourth most common element in the planet's crust. So why was it up here? You know, there's your 100-year average. Reversion to the mean. It's bounced up. It's trading around 56, but why should it leave there when Billiton Reels and Volet are bragging? They're cutting costs. They got costs below 20 now. The three biggest exporters can produce and make money at 20. So I don't know why it's going to go back up. They can make money at 20 for five more years. Easy. Coal prices, same story. Looney Tunes, complete Looney Tunes. Long-term average is 60. That's exactly where it is. Why is coal going to go up when the other energy is getting cheaper? So I just see more. And believe me, this could easily come down, huh? We had 20 years of prices below the mean. What do we have here? 30 years. 30 years, prices are below. You know, we go below the mean for three years. It's going to be Armageddon. And it's possible. Huh? We've had our party. I know parties. They always get over too quick. Platinum, this was no brainer. This was too low and had been here many times. It couldn't stay here. It's unsustainable. Yet South Africa made money here. We were so efficient, we could make money at these kind of prices. Problem is we put all that money into the ground. Government freed up all the mineral rights. They let everybody have them, especially foreigners. Now we got had a short-term boom. Now there's way too much platinum in the world. If this just comes back to the mean, these platinum shares will lose another 33%. And boy, this is strong gravity here. This isn't just Earth pulling. This is like Saturn, Neptune. Strong mean pulling back. Gold. This is the biggest anomaly on my chart now. Long-term price of gold, 540. You can go back to Christopher Columbus. You can go back to George Washington. You know, it just cruises. There was no inflation for hundreds of years, so gold just stayed at 540. So anybody who even remotely believes in reversion to the mean, you're going to lose sleep because gold's got a long ways. Now, I don't know if there's any mines out there that make money at 1,000. They will after they lay off three-quarters of the people, change work practices, negotiate lower tariffs. But it'll be painful, and it'll be long-term. It'll be two, three, four years to cut costs. So this is very scary to me. Um, there's a lot more reason to believe gold's coming to 800 than going to 16, in my view. Copper, I use this as a proxy for base metals. Same story. Um, it's trading above its mean, not a lot, not like gold. Nobody's trading like gold. Gold is trading at double its long-term mean. So to me, it's the most vulnerable, the riskiest of the bunch. Okay, JSE Alzi, JSE Resi. Total return in dollars. 10 years, zero return. Hey, it could be worse. That's assuming you bought here and here. But if you bought up there, you could be down 50%. And why is this going to go up? We saw commodity prices still look high. Earnings are still falling. The best we can hope for is this levels off. The best. So there we are. In critical, huh? 
How did we end up here? By not paying attention and not revisiting where are we on the curve. Well, we know where we are now. We're at the tail end of the curve. Well, not the tail end. We're just on the steep part. It's still falling. Okay. Will the JSE Resi revert to the SP500? Yes, it probably will. Because our JSE Resi, as we saw, it's foreign companies. It doesn't really matter what happens in South Africa. It will revert back to the S&P 500 someday. I don't know if it'll be in my lifetime. Um, you know, look at this run here. That was, that was a one in 100 year commodity boom. And it fell from 1980 till about 2003. It fell for 20 years. Now it ran for 10. It's fallen for about six or seven. So yeah, maybe it falls another five or six. Maybe it falls another 10. Maybe it even bounces up. You know, maybe we get some bounces like this. It's a possible, but this, this is more gambling. This isn't investing. It's, we're gambling on a bounce. Investing is when you're very sure you're going to beat that benchmark. Remember that 11%. It's a stock picker's market. It's not a trend. This was a trend. You could buy anything here. You know, when commodity prices had fallen for 20 years, almost nobody was making money except the South Africans. Ratings were at 20, 30-year lows. You know, everything lined up. Trough earnings, low ratings, um, no new production, rapidly expanding China, falling interest rates. You know, you could tick all the boxes. You know, it, it was being telegraphed to us. This was a genuine run. Maybe that top part was a little make-believe, but this was a genuine run. But we're years away from having all those um, factors come into positive territory now. You see, there's your rating. See, up here, the S&P was trading at four times the P of our resi, and the long-term average of 1.7. So it was trading at more than double. These were great times to buy. I remember this. I was working for Nedcore then. I think our fund did 130. Alan Gray did 120. You know, the resi just blew everything out. Even the Aussie did 70. See, that was abnormal. It was a standard deviation out. So those were great times. That was a great time, huh? That was in 2008, 2009. Excellent time to buy. Remember, Anglos and them fell down to about 120 bucks. But now, now it's actually a bit of an expensive time to buy. Not real expensive, but it's not cheap. Up here is expensive for the S&P, cheap for us. Down here, the S&P is cheap, expensive for us. All right, the gold index. See, for 100 years, look at what you got for a dividend. 11, 10, 8. Uh, I still got 8. Even in the 60s, 70s, it was worth going in there. Even if the gold price didn't move, you got your 8% dividend. Then it started falling. I don't know what happened here. Just because sanctions fell, we were allowed to invest offshore, all of a sudden we thought it's okay to buy a gold share on a 1% dividend yield. Heaven knows why. I think it was the Canadians that told us this was the new era. New millennium, new dividend yield. But how do you throw away a 100-year history? You don't. Guys weren't dumb then. Guys were dumb here. Gold index. No capital growth in 40 years. That was a time to get out. All this was a time. Huh? That's your get out of jail card. Your get out of critical in the hospital. Now you're back in and you're going to be in for a while. You're going to serve your time now. Yeah. Why, why was the gold index so low? No friggin' earnings. No earnings at all. Earnings were falling all those years. And here's what's tragic. When the commodity prices went up in the 70s, earnings smoked. But this time, uh, 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 just couldn't get off the ground. No friggin' earnings. And, and gold went up higher here than it did then, and it stayed up longer. So it shows something serious has changed here. Now I'm going to show you the slides. You have to realize when your environment changes, then the old rules don't apply. Then reversion to the mean doesn't even apply. Okay, back here, our model still worked. Management had control over their minds. You could predict earnings if you could predict the gold price. And it worked. Stop picking allowed you to beat the index. You relied on your models. 
you relied on a 100-year track record of our mining companies being the best at controlling costs. On the planet, South African mining companies control costs the best. But moving on, by the new millennium, as I showed you in earlier slides, you didn't have to pick the share. You just picked the sector. Mining just ran. Because it had fallen for 20 years, trough earnings, trough rating, falling interest rates, you just picked the sector here and you outperformed. You were in a mining peloton and you were beating the all-share index peloton. But we know over time, the all-share catches everybody. So you had to get out in time. Now look at, for 100 years, shares beat the gold price. It was better to be in gold shares than in gold. But the new millennium, all old rules don't apply. There's new rules applying. Look at this, gold is creaming the gold shares, and not by a little bit. Huh? From three, in fact, you can say from 2.5 to 25, tenfold. In 10 years, the gold price has made 10 times more than shares. Unbelievable. Even platinum now, 300%, seven, eight years. Same thing. The metal is better than a share, at least in South Africa. Platinum index, 0% return for 14 years. And we know why, huh? No frigging earnings. No earnings, no share price. They've never made earnings in dollars. Look at it. In the 80s, they were making more earnings than now, and platinum's a lot higher. They've just got back to break even. It's insane. In government unions, I don't know. I'm sure they see this like you do, I do, but it seems to trigger different electrical impulses in their mind than it does in us. And lawn men. Nobody's been picked on more than lawn men. Look at the share price here. It's saddled with BE credits. And every time the share price falls, they got to issue more shares. They got to go to the bank and borrow more to give to the BE. It's, you know, whoever devised BE definitely devised the demise of the South African mining industry. You couldn't come up with a policy better designed to kill our mining industry. It's insane. There could be no finance class in the world that could say this is a sustainable model. But you got cyclical mining shares borrowing money from banks to give to BEs and they're borrowing all the way down with no chance of repaying. And, and who gets picked on more than lawn men? I see it in the paper. They're always picking on it, the unions, the economists for true transparency. They're in some little hotel here in a non anonymous room, these economists for transparency that found lawn men was um, transfer pricing in their Barbados. I don't know. Th this is reality. Everybody who's bought lawn men, everybody who ever bought has lost money, most of it. And this is the platinum index we saw has been the most horrible index the last few years. It's been worse than the gold index the last 10 years. This is lawn men compared to the worst index on the planet. And it's lost 90% to the worst index. You know, these are records. These will be in the Smithsonian. Sassel. It shows some shares can still beat the commodity price, like all shares used to. You only buy a share if it's gonna beat the commodity price. But it's tougher to find them and it's riskier. And even so, did it really beat oil by very much? No. Okay, this does ignore the dividend. And that's very important, that's a 4% dividend. So you add a 4% dividend, this curve would go like that. So give credit where it's due, Sassel's done a good job beating their commodity price. Can they keep it up? They have diversified quite a bit offshore, but you need very good management to do it. Resi versus Indy. It's lost 80%. I know it looks perfect like a rebound, but I've shown you factors that make me wary of a rebound. Property, Resi versus property. Property's done as good as um, the industrial index. Resi's blown out. But maybe this is just the era we're in. Because look, for a long time, the resi smoked property. Now granted, this is capital only. Property had about a 78% dividend. So this wouldn't have been so steep. But um, 
you know, property overdid it in the 70s and had a 20-year drought here, and resources ran. So it could happen again, but I think it's going to be a few years. And if it does, I don't think it's going to be this kind of outperformance. Okay, platinum. Gold mine revenue. This is where the country's hurting. Look at the money we used to get from gold mines. This is in real terms. $35 billion. $15 billion. $16, $17 billion. Now, we barely get $6 billion. So the country is hurting by not getting this money. And look at the government's hurting. Shareholders. When the gold price ran in the 70s, everybody won. There's taxes. The government got almost 70 billion rand that year. 50 billion. You know, the government, they got a lot. Shareholders, yeah, they, they increased. They didn't get as much as the government. But look at here. You, you got to remember, gold ran here, huh? Remember, gold ran $1,800, $1,900. So what happened to government shareholders? Both of them have willingly given their money to socialism. So who got all this money? The workers, including management. Unions got 12, 13, 14% increases, 10, 12 years, no problem. Productivity went down. Management, they took a lot too. You don't have Oppenheimer, you don't have Menel Hersov managing these gold companies anymore. They've got diverse, diffused management all over the world. So when the cat's away, the mice are at play. So we effectively socialized our precious metal mines in the new millennium. We said whatever profits are made, they go to the workers. So, you know, the, Russia may have fell for communism, but boy, it's reincarnated here. So the workers got all the money. All the workers got the money. The state got nothing. And shareholders got Foucault. Look at that. There's what happened. There's gold. Gold's run. Nobody, nothing. Completely missed out. So all these guys who held gold shares 20 years waiting for the uptick got screwed over big. Now, here's where it's really worrying for the country. <coughs> South Africa, we increased gold production every year. Even though gold was flat, $32, $34 an ounce, we kept increasing production. When gold started going up, we started decreasing production. We tried holding it, but it's been slipping. But the rest of the world is very happy. From 1973 on, took a couple years to get the money for the mines. The world's happy at, at all the gold prices of the last 30, 40 years. They're very happy. So why can 199 <coughs> countries make money on gold and we can't? Used to be vice versa. Used to be we're the only country that could make money on gold and the rest of the world couldn't. So that's what I mean. Everything's 180 degrees different. There's our production. Devastating. There's every indication this will be zero by 2020. Mine employment, there's every indication this will be zero by 2020. And if the gold price falls harder, faster, this will happen sooner. From a height of 550,000 men, maybe we got 110 now. It's, it's, I don't even think we got 110 now. So if I put in this year's figures, it's probably right here. This is what you call an inexorable trend. It means it can't be stopped. Relentless. Okay. Mining jobs, depending on who you listen to, get every economist in the country. They will fall between here. For every mining job, we create one to two jobs on a subsidiary industry. So if you went to Vitbank, Velcom, Clarksdorp, Virginia, you go down Main Street, there's all these engineering firms. They were all producing goods and services for the mines. So without a doubt, mining does create jobs. In Australia, the ratio is over three. Let's see. There's 187,400 people working in Australia on the mines. They claim it's actually 599, 500. I rounded up. But pretty impressive, even if they're exaggerating like a lot of Australians do they at least get more than two to one. So in 87, 65 gold mines, 550 people. There was more than a million people working for those 550. Now we got 100,000. 
Other mines have 400,000. So we got 500,000 people total. It's still gold alone. It's probably lost a million people. We had 1.2 million in the subsidiary industries. Okay, exports in Australia, 138, and I think we had 39 billion. So they're four times us in exports. Freedom, meritocracy. I don't know if there's any of this in mining now. You know, do workers have the freedom to choose which mine they want to work at, what pay they take? It's all decided by the union. You know, it's like Russia reincarnated here. The state decides everything for you. And this is another inexorable trend. And it's not a great trend because this is more and more people who are being told they deserve something. More and more people who are demanding something. Houses, sewage, utilities, education. The more people you have, the more they demand, and I don't know where it's going to come from. Mankind versus the world. Man's definitely winning. Depending which anthropologist, economist you talk to, the world's designed for 300. It's, it's designed for 150 sustainably. But they say you could survive for quite a few thousand years with 300 million people. But we've exceeded that. Africa was designed for 34 million, but it could have handled 67. We've exceeded that. Western Cape was designed for 144, and that's what was here in 1500. It was in balance for thousands of years, but somehow the Europeans did change it. Now it's got 6.1. Cape Town, when Jan van Riebeck came here, there was about 500 people, and that's what it was designed for. It could handle 1,000, which it did for a while, but now we got... This is 450,000. Sorry, I left off a zero. So we got 450,000 where 500 should have been. Okay, people say our gold mines have lower grade ore. That's why they're closing. We, all, we know better than that, right? It's bullshit. This is the rock they're taking out of the mines in real terms. For every ton of rock they take out of our gold mines, they're getting about 230 to 220 a ton. It's only been that high once. In fact, I got another graph going. It was that high, I think, back in 1900. So look, we were happily taking out rock at 100 a ton. Now we're breaking even at 220. It's not grades, it's efficiencies and costs. There's ounces of gold per employee. There's where we are. 40 ounces per man. That's where we were in 1986. That's where we were in 1940, 1950. Uh, 1907. And we know how we were mining there, right? Sledgehammers, chisels, and buckets. So where's productivity? Uh, you read about China, America, Europe, all this productivity, how, how many cars you build per worker, how many houses you build per man. And look, it was jerky, but we were getting some pretty good productivity increases, even back up here. So our productivity has gone down from 70 to 30. We've lost almost 50%. We have to regain 100% to get back to where we were 40 years ago. So it's why it doesn't matter what you pay the people. They're overpaid if their productivity is falling 50%. This is the key. Even more insane is we're encouraging open pit mines, the government and unions. They're 10 times more destructive. This is a platinum mine, can you believe it? Anybody know how thick a platinum reef is? Around a meter. It's down there, I don't know if you can see it. It's down there someplace. And this is in a nature reserve, Polonisburg, and they're using government money. This is the IDC that funded this mine. So that's, we're 180 degrees different. We're doing things that don't make sense. 10 times more destructive. This mine will never make money, whatever the platinum price is. Underground mines, they employ 10 times as many people. And these are skilled jobs. These aren't guys driving a dump truck. You know, my dog can do that. Underground miners, they lay track. They put in rock bolts. They decide where the, the electrical wires must go. There's a lot more skills underground than driving dump trucks. One-tenth the environmental damage. And here's the best bonus, other than 10 times the people, 90% local content. You keep the money in the country. This thing, where, does, where do these machines come from overseas? And they suck up diesel from overseas. 
We're doing everything opposite here. Anybody want to know where this country's going, just go to the bookstore. Huh? Ann Rand forecast this 50, 60 years ago. Who's read this book? Huh? And you're still investing here. <laughs> I, I don't think you could uh, forecast better what's happened here. Who's running? This is in the book all the time, huh? Are they helping our industry? Who are they helping? They put their own mates out of work. It's like they're driving this airplane. They're throwing four out of five guys out of the plane so that the one guy who stays gets a better seat. And he's still going the same place. Is it unions? Is it government? This isn't negotiation. They say they want to negotiate. You know, negotiation, it's equal, equal. Both sides give, both sides take. And it's, you don't negotiate when people break into your house, they pour gas on you, and they threaten you with a match. That's not negotiation. It's extortion. Oh, legislation. Nothing improves productivity when it's legislated. I've never seen it or heard it. And boy, mining's got more legislation than any other industry. It's too visible. They don't know what the industrial companies are doing but they know what the mining companies are doing. They can see them. So they keep legislating, more policy, more legislation, more, more, more. And everybody's an expert in mining now. You know, there's so many reasons for high costs on our mines. Wage increases, where's ESCOM? You know, ESCOM says, you don't even know you're getting electricity. Why would you sink a deep level mine? Who's in charge? It's, it's a, uh, it's a tug of war. It's somewhere between nobody's in charge and everybody's in charge. But both are detrimental. And, and just read a paper. Academics, South African Communist Party. I don't know, do they even run for election? But they got a big say. They all know how to run our mining companies. I don't know if there's three people here I can name who have even worked on a mine. But they all know how to run mines. And now you got unions fighting but they want to come on my turf, my house, and they want to fight. And they want to use my equipment. You know, that's the most, you're, you're trying to run a deep level mine, keep people safe and productive, and you got unions fighting on your turf. All right, who's running our industry today? Well, now we got a guy, radical Ramath Lodi. You know, somebody thinks when you create a disaster, let's get real radical and it's going to get better. You know, your house is on fire, let's throw in a hand grenade and get real radical. Look, maybe a hand grenade will put the fire out. It won't build the house, though. Somebody does have to get radical. And if going back to basics is radical, I'm for it. Because what they're doing now is not working. It's actually working worse. The more people that interfere, the worse it is. This is the new South African gold industry. It's real radical, all right. And it's got managers, but not the kind you know. They don't pay taxes, but they pay protection fees, and it's out of control. What really matters to South Africans? This is in the Sunday Times. It's the most read newspaper we've got. And I'll tell you, I pretty much agree. Everybody I talk to, I talk to my workers, colleagues. What's most important in South Africa? Half of them said a job. There's too few jobs. Look. Poverty, I agree. Criminal activity, corruption. These are pretty important, important factors. You wonder if any politicians or unions think of this when they go about their daily actions. We definitely need a new blueprint because this is Atlas Shrugged. And we're in part two now. And it's not very good. Government debt. We actually held our own here for a while from the, the new elections. Went up, but we held. But look at now, it's just out of control. From 60 billion to almost 160. Anybody, any reason this is gonna come down? By closing gold mines, how are you gonna lower your debt? You know, and debt, that's why it's banned in the Bible. The Koran. All the holy books ban it. It's a drug, you can't get off it. And mining companies, I haven't seen a mining company get out of debt. Harmony did for a little bit, but they couldn't hold it and they slipped. It's, we all know debt. It is a drug. It's almost impossible to get out of. 
and it doesn't build companies. I'll challenge anybody here to name two companies built on debt, and I'm being serious. We can talk afterwards. Microsoft, Rockefeller, Ford, nobody borrows money to build a company. You, you sell shares, you get equity. How can you borrow? You don't know if you're going to make profits. When you borrow, you got to pay interest. How governments steal from their people, inflation. Huh? Back in the 60s, one buck, now you need 75 bucks. Anybody know this guy? They're all, huh? Is there one man who knows this guy? Why do I put him up in a mining presentation? You guys are out of it. You gotta watch Grand Prix motorcycle racing if you wanna know how to fix an industry. Valentino Rossi. He's tied with the greatest motorcycle rider of all time, and he's cocky. He rode for Aprilla, then Honda poached him, and he won every year for Honda. But who doesn't win for Honda, right? They got all the money, the best bikes. Okay, he's a good rider. But every year the crowd and the press start saying, yeah, you're great, Valentino, but you're riding for Honda. After a while, it starts eating at his brain. He knows he's good, but he starts wondering, am I really the best if what they say is right? Yamaha tried getting the guy for years. So one day, he just walks into Yamaha's office. He says, can I get a job riding for you? They fell off their feet. Couldn't believe it. They've been trying to beat Honda for decades. Now the greatest rider walks in. He says, I'll ride for you. Signs up. He goes back to Honda, and he tells his mechanic, hey, we're changing jobs. We're going to Yamaha. The mechanic's an Australian. Jer what is it? Jerry Burgess. He says, hey. We're not changing, you change jobs. I'm looking for retirement. I got two years at Honda, I got a good pension. I get treated like a king. Good luck, Valentino. Now he's worried, because he's got a brain, Valentino. He knows bikes. And he saw how Yamaha works on bikes. If a Yamaha doesn't win, they tear it apart and they rebuild the whole thing. Now at Honda, he rides that bike, he tells Jer Jerry Burgess, Something's wrong at the front end. He says, okay, let's put some air in the tire. And he drives it five or 10 laps. Let's take some air out of the tire. Let's put some oil in the shocks. Let's put a different spring. It's incremental changes. And that's how Honda did things. And that's how he finally got, he had a week to go and he managed to crack old uh, Jerry Burgess and the team. They came across to Yamaha. And we know what happened. He won. Yamaha was unbeatable for the years that he was there. So what can we learn from him? It's a Japanese word called keizen. It means the law of incremental improvements. You try, try, try. And sometimes that might even make you go backwards. Boy, you back up quick. You get rid of that change. If that policy, if that legislation works, if it cuts one job, you back off. You don't keep putting more and more and more like Yamaha did. Incremental improving changes. All right. I've used up all my time. I got three, four minutes. I didn't have a trick because you didn't need it. I grew up in the world's richest silver district. A third of my class didn't have a trick. You went straight to the mines. You made big money. They trained you. They fed you, clothed you. And there were so many layers of management that it never seemed out of your reach to climb one more rung. Like our mines here, they had all these levels. But what do you hear the union? They hate levels. They love cutting these levels out and having everybody on the same plane. You know, it, that's pure communism. And the mines diversified. They had zinc plant, cadmium plant, lead plant. This was a silver mine, but they did it without the government forcing them. They did all the beneficiation they could. So you start stripping zinc. You're too young to go underground. This is a cock job. It's acid, it's electricity. You work your guts out so you get promoted out of here, believe me. Even underground breaking rocks was better than the zinc plant, and you got paid more. There was another rung you could go. Then you got on a motor, another rung. Another rung. Pretty soon you're mining. You keep working, you're making more money. They're training you, they're feeding you, they're educating. All mines are like that. That's what these mines did. 140 training colleges when I came here on the mines, 1982. Now there's probably four, maybe five. And the government didn't fund. No CETAs. The mining companies funded it. Eventually, they help you go to school. Why I left to come here? You want to keep moving. You want to see how the best do it. Three miles underground.
trackless mining. This was going to be a silver bullet. Now, IMCO brought this machine over in 1936. De Beers bought the first mechanized loader. And that's how we had innovation, modernization, mechanization when it worked. Our gold mines did Japanese Kaizen. They would try it. If it worked, they bought more. If it didn't work, you throw it out. You don't just keep going forward and forward like they've done with these big loaders. I worked for IMCO two years, and I told my boss, the answer is not in the equipment, it's in training. You train people, you'll get multiples in productivity. You get a bigger loader, what do you get? 10% increase in productivity. Humans have multiples of increases. Well, I only had a few more slides. So that's where we are today. 6,150 abandoned mines, a lot of those mines. You put a little bit of money in, you can make multiples on it. It's hard getting your government permits, but that's the only way I see. That's going back in the old days. You're not going to make it trading shares. You're going to invest in individual mines. It's stock pickers. You buy a mine from the government for a buck. You put $2 million into permitting it, put $5 million into drilling it, but that mine can then be worth $10 million, 20, 50. And I think we're going to have to start out with small mines because no one's putting money in the big mines, even though a big mine has economies of scale and efficiencies that can't be beat. But big is bad in mining in this country. And there's many other ways of playing commodities now that you don't have to go into mines. And these are much safer. You don't have management risk. You don't have political risk. You don't have grade risk. You don't have ESCOM risk. You know, these, you have maybe the price risk of the commodity, maybe a little exchange. So there's so many lower risks, but if you still want to be in mining, you got to be here. You got to control the mine. And I mean you, not the government, not ESCOM, not the union. If, if, they're, if they're calling the shots, you don't want to be involved. Neil Froneman doesn't run Sabanya. And he knows it. Gwedi Montash does. Vavi, Irwin Jim, they run Sabanya. Chris Griffiths doesn't run Amplats. Guaca Ramathodi runs Amplats. Um, Joseph Matunjwa, Franz Baleni, they're the ones. They want to meet him now. Chris spends 80% of his time running errands for those guys instead of managing that mine. Mechanization isn't always the answer to increase productivity. A long handled shovel, 50% more efficient than a short handle. 50% increase in productivity. A hydraulic drill, instead of air, double, double to triple the productivity. You still need a man, but you now have your other two men drilling three times as much. Still using our hands, making 200 a day instead of 21. We know about the Chinese. Americans built that much railroad in three years. What did they do? They dropped the color bar. They said, not only white Caucasians can work on the railroads, anybody can. We need the unions to drop some rules here and let anybody work who wants to. 16 kilometers a track towards the end. In one day, this is 140 years ago, 150 years ago. Meritocracy, productivity, there's no other way. 